Welcome back to The Call Up, your go-to podcast on the future stars of Major League Baseball. As always, we're your hosts. I'm Aram Layton, Jack McMullen over here. And Jack, you just finally got to get the season going, man. You were at the ballpark, obviously, play-by-play guy for the AAA Indianapolis Indians. Have a lot of things to break down there. I was surfing the internet, watching as many different streams as I could while I was at my girlfriend's family's house for her dad's 60th, would sneak away and try to watch, got to watch a little bit of Taj Bradley, got to watch a little bit of Grayson Rodriguez, a little bit of Libertor, really kind of crash course the condensed games after that. And a a lot of fun takeaways from not even week one, series one, I would say, uh, of this AAA season so far. Excited to break it all down with you. Yeah, 100%. Well, first and foremost, happy belated to Mr. Aram's girlfriend's last name. Yes. Um, sure, that was great. Uh, big 6-0. It felt really good to be back in front of live baseball and, and calling a game again. And like, obviously, selfishly, it was fun to call a game again. But, you know, we got to the World Baseball Classic. That was awesome. You know, we were sitting in the stands and all that. But that was a, a very elevated, intense moment. I think what we love about baseball, and I think what what wrapped us into regular season baseball was the cool, calm, collected nature of the game, right? And it is a way more enjoyable watch and experience when you're at the ballpark than many of the other major sports because there's a bunch of other stuff going on. Totally. I was so happy to just have like some calm baseball in front of me again. Like it felt like my zen, my happy place. And I'm sure that's kind of how you felt all weekend, keeping tabs on everything. Yeah. So, you know, the thing for me that I was like kind of like shaking when I was away from my computer, just because like not because I'm addicted to it, but because I've missed so much the vastness of what comes with minor league baseball. Like for me, research is one of the most you know fun parts of what we do with this podcast. Right. Like for you, I know sometimes I'm sure it gets tedious, but with your broadcasting, like you do a lot of research, you pride yourself on being one of the most knowledgeable guys in the booth. You'd never say it, but like, I know that's something that you really pride yourself on is having all the background on everybody, but that part's kind of fun, right? Because when you've got all of these games going on and right now it's just triple a, but even then I want to see how certain guys are trending, how certain guys are throwing, who's struggling, who's doing well. Is, is this guy throwing the cutter more? Is this fastball ticking up? AKA Matthew Libertor, which we're going to talk about. Like to me, yeah. there's so many answers to be found that I just love searching for them. And every day there's a slate of games and every day something happened and there's something to unpack. Obviously you don't want to put too much stock in one single thing, but an example would be Kyle Manzardo talked about how he wants to, you know, start swinging with a little bit more authority this year. Yeah. That's a raised prospect first baseman. He's going to be well inside of our top 100. He said last year I was really focused on making contact and competing at the high uh, upper levels. This was on locked on Rays, by the way, he did a great interview over there. Um, and and now I want to cut loose a little bit more and and try to hit for some more power. In literally the second game of the year, he puts up 107.4 mile per hour exit velocity. His max last year in 100 and whatever games was 107.8 miles per hour. So in just a couple games, the odds of him already almost reaching that number by accident very low. I'd venture to say that he's going to have a new max exit velocity this year because he's tapping into more power. Those are trends that I just love to try to discover and find. And that's why I love doing this. Yeah, man. I mean, the game can become a small world. And this is like almost a, a therapy session, like open letter, open love letter to baseball. But I mean, you and I both know how freaking lucky we are to be able to call this work where it may feel tedious at points, but hey, this beats like anything else, you know? Oh, yeah. People for fun look at pitch mix on pitchers and we get to do it for work. So here we are looking for things like that. It's almost like, you know, a a layered look at baseball. So obviously we look at, you know, the databases that we have access to and and fan graphs and all that stuff. And, you know, we, we see what's happening numerically to certain guys. Yeah. We are in the position where we can talk to these certain guys too. And we can talk to their manager. We can talk to them one-on-one and ask them, why they are doing so well opening day friday nice afternoon at the ballpark i go up to the cage i talk to travis swaggerty who hit 380 with an 1100 ops in the spring like guy balled out in the spring and i can ask him i can look at the numbers all i want but i go up to travis and i say hey what changed and i get it straight from him yeah that's, that's instead of thinking part. internally, instead of thinking about the changes that I made in the offseason, this was the first spring training where I started to think externally. And I thought about beating the pitcher instead of what I need to do in swing mechanics. And all of a sudden, the guy puts out 380. 
it can be a small world if you do your homework here yeah. and you you know ask the right questions and and that was a very like simple point a to point b he had this change in mindset this is how the numbers changed now let's watch it yeah. and that that's the goods man that's the best part of being around these minor league baseball players a hundred percent and happy triple a opening day to all those who are as excited about it as as we are and i assume if you listen to this podcast or you're watching us on youtube uh you probably are so we are going to try to get you that information of of some of the trends and and guys that you know might be figuring something out guys who might be finding something i know swaggerty is someone that it's actually worth monitoring because he is someone that I think has, has made some tangible adjustments to, to your point there. And we're going to always try to keep you all clued in on that. So we'll, we'll start with some of the indie takeaways that you had. And then I want to fly all around the, the, you know, all around the diamond and all around triple a, because we had what, what was kind of poised to be the matchup of all matchups with Taj Bradley versus Grayson Rodriguez. But guess what? Some of these pitchers are a little bit rusty. Grayson Rodriguez kind of a letdown start, meaning that not just how he performed in that start. I think for him, he probably thought he was making the opening day roster. We all did. He struggled a bit in the spring. I didn't love yeah. the comments from Michael Elias. I understand what he was saying. The comments came off a little bit silly. We don't even need to get into that. Dickish. It, Honestly, it, dickish. It was a little, it was unnecessary. You could have said he, he didn't quite meet our expectations. We look forward to seeing him soon. Leave it at that. But it was a little bit more than that. Regardless, he struggled. Um, that, that was not his best start. He has not looked great. The stuff is there though. So I'm not going to sound the alarms. I'm not going to be worried about it yet. Taj Bradley looked really good out of the gate. Velo ticked down a little bit as the start went on. You know, it was mm -hmm. mid nineties to start. Was more down to ninety two as the start went on. So both the Rays and and Orioles' top pitching prospects did not, you know, turn out the pitchers' duel that we thought. I'll, I'll break that down a little bit later. Uh, but I, I kind of want to talk about you know how we should look at these guys as they go, and then we'll talk about Libby. We'll talk about standout bats through the first series. You know, and and also. Guys in the PCL that weren't in the PCL, whether you should take the power with a grain of salt, a la J.J. Bleday and, and some <laughs> yeah, other guys. Bleday. Evan Smith has 14 home runs in like 31 games, by the way, which I don't care <laughs> if you're playing on the moon. That is impressive. I don't care if he's playing in Williamsport. That's yeah. impressive. So we'll talk a little bit about that, too. But let's start with Indy, man, because you got some interesting storylines there uh, from Luis Ortiz, who kind of battled himself. In that start, and it ended up turning out, I think, a fine outing to start the year, if, especially if we're comparing it to a lot of other guys that struggled as high-level pitching prospects. But you've also got Nick Gonzalez playing a little bit of third and second. You've got the great Andy Rodriguez, who you know didn't waste any time to hit his first home run, is putting together some good ABs. Mike yeah. Burrows look good. I'll kind of tee you up for everything, but th this is a really interesting team that you got going on with some interesting storylines within it. Yeah, I'm spoiled, and they saw Omaha this weekend, so I'll give you two guys on Omaha that really stood out to me, and then I'll jump into Indy. Um, the one bat, I've got one bat, one arm. I'll start with the reliever. Evan Sisk is a left-hander that came back for Michael A. Taylor from the Twins. That guy has the makings of a back-end reliever. Like He looks like a setup guy. He is lefty, sidearm to low three-quarters, it sweeps across the zone when he snaps off breaking balls and the fastball jumps on you. I think he was low to mid nineties with a fastball from that arm slot. Yep. It felt high nineties because of where he releases it. Sisk was incredibly impressive. And then the one bat that really jumped out to me was Tyler Gentry. And I know that you've been high on Tyler Gentry. This was, I want to say third round pick out of Alabama in 2020 Gentry is going to be a corner outfielder for the Royals at some point this year. Cause the outfield We've talked about it. That unit as a whole is not very good. I think Isbell can do a good job in center, but Gentry, like I think there is a spot for him in right field. And I think he's going to grab it in June or July and not relinquish it for a couple of years. I, I was really happy when, when you said that Gentry looked good, because that's a guy I have not gotten an in-person look at yet, but the data looks good. The numbers are undeniable. And he, he's a guy that, you know, is going to fly under radars a little bit because he does a lot of things. Well, nothing exceptionally well, um, yeah. which, you know, those guys always seem to fly under the radar, but if you hit at an above average clip, put power up at, at slightly above average clip and do everything else pretty well, he's got decent speed. He plays decent defense. That's a guy that I do think is probably one of their best outfield options right now. Did you get much of Nick Lofton? Did you see much of Nick Lofton? He, he was really shaky in AAA last year, obviously was getting acclimated to center field after being drafted as a shortstop. I still think has a good chance of being a utility guy. But I don't want to say the ship has sailed on everyday reps. I'm excited to see more of him. 
Yeah, I got a look, and he wasn't that great in my limited look at him. Um, I, I want to say he started like three for 13. Um, he did hit a homer in the series finale. He was three for 15 overall with a yeah. homer and three driven in. He only struck out three times. That's the thing. He's not going to strike out a lot. He's got he's speed. He's not going to strike out. He he had enough power. Like his homer just snuck over the yeah. left field, like yeah. a home run line, like, like that yellow line. So um, I don't know. I didn't take away much there. They had him at third every game. And I'm not really, really? sure how they, yeah. I I'm think that's just really to keep sure. him in the lineup right now, honestly, because but I, I see thing. him as like a center field slash like utility guy at this point. I was I was talking to Nick Batters, who's the new voice of uh, Omaha after Jake Eisenberg went up to Kansas City, former guest of the call up. But Nick said he should be the everyday third baseman in Omaha this year. And I was like, ooh, interesting. Where's yeah. the spot there? Obviously, like there is a spot at third base for Kansas City with, you know, Hunter Dozier playing over there right now and Bobby Witt at short. Um, but. I found it Not really interesting when you've got like nothing going on in the outfield, you can put Lofton in the outfield. Like I just, I imagine a world where you figure out third base and you've got Lofton in left, Isbell in center, Gentry in right. And you're relatively happy. I think they like Samad Taylor out there probably a little bit more. Samad too. Taylor played think- second all three days. Samad Taylor can absolutely fly. I was pretty impressed by him. He's he's fun. He's a fun player. Also, real quick before we move on to another topic, not the first time Evan Sisk has been brought up on this podcast. And also, I have a tweet on Evan Sisk from January 23rd. I thought I remembered putting this out there. You're going to freak out at these numbers. So I, I this was the tweet. From January 23rd, the two arms headed over to Kansas City come with some relative intrigue. Evan Sisk is an extremely funky lefty reliever with a crossbody delivery. Guess what left-handed hitters hit against him last year? Nothing. They did nothing. 084, 197, 093 in 124 plate appearances before between double A and triple A. Yeah, that that tweet about Evan Sisk got way more run than I thought. And I think it's just because he's his delivery is so you know absurd. what it is? It's the Chris Sale arm slot where like it's lanky left-hander. It feels like the ball is coming from right field. You have left-handed bats pretty much looking down the first baseline yeah. to receive the pitch. Yeah, he's going to be he's going to be a force honestly in their bullpen. I think we saw Tim Heron of uh, the Guardians come out strike out all four guys he faced. That was a guy that they protected from the Rule 5 for a reason. I think he's kind of cut from the same cloth there with with Tim Heron of the Guardians. So on your home team side, you know, Nicky G, we were texting about him last night. Uh, Nick Gonzalez for the Pirates organization, uh, a guy that, you know, I've always been a bit biased on just being, you know, having been able to see him go about his business for an entire summer uh, on the Cape and you just knowing the way he carries himself, watching him win Cape Cod Player of the Year, of course, is going to give me a little bit of bias. And I try to always be honest about that. The whiffs were concerning, but I saw a change in his load uh, in in the way that he was getting into his backside. Now he starts earlier. He gets in there better. He was more hunched over before he's more upright. And I think all of these things are allowing him to get to fastballs at the top of the zone and allowing him to be a little bit quicker to the ball. Uh, he's already turned around a couple fastballs, including a 106 mile an hour home run. Um, this is a guy that it was one of the safer bats in the draft and it was him and Austin Martin. I still take his bat well ahead of Austin Martin's. I don't think there's any doubt about that, but the other issue was health, right? He wasn't looking healthy. He kept getting banged up. He kept dealing with injuries. Not only is he healthy, his arm looks stronger as you pointed out to me. And I went and dig, dug up some of the video. He looks good. I, I don't know how the arm's going to play at third. We got to see more of that, but People thought the arm was average for second. It looks above average for second now. I think he's well, worked on that. I would love for you to get us some information on that as to whether Nick has, uh, you know, done some things to strengthen the arm because I know that was a point of emphasis for him. I know that in terms of like scouts, obviously he he had to hear that. And and I wonder if that was a focus because he did play third base in the Arizona Fall League and and also, you know, has has looked a lot stronger there. So if he can play multiple spots now too, that helps the profile a ton and takes a little bit of pressure off of the bat. But I still believe in that bat. And now you do too, because you texted me some glowing things, even after those first few games. Well, physically, he looks great. Very firm handshake. Do with that information what (laughs) you will. But uh, I mean, dude, like I had no doubts about the arm when I saw him on Friday at second base. He had a crossbody throw. He fielded a ball on his backhand behind second base. Yeah. 
Um, and he was pretty much like falling into shallow center and entirely cross body, like zero momentum going towards first. It was a 72 mile an hour throw, which like is pretty impressive to get that over to first base at 72 miles an hour. Um, also, thank God for StatCast on the research yeah. portal now at AAA. Awesome. So happy. But you watched, I want to say, two or three plays at third that he had on Sunday where he went to his forehand. And obviously you've got momentum working there. But I mean, he unleashed some cannons yeah. from third to first. So obviously that's gotten a lot better. There should be no concerns about his arm at second base. I think it's a serviceable arm at third base in a limited sample that I've seen from him. But you mentioned health. Like, obviously, swing and miss is a thing. Nearly 700 plate appearances at the minor league level. He's got 194 strikeouts. So, you know, that that K rate is high. But when he's been on the field in professional baseball, he has been really, really good. And, yeah. and he has not been hindered whatsoever. 154 games. So consider it a full major league season. And tell me if you will take these numbers. 285, 384, 506 slash line, 44 doubles, 25 homers, 91 driven in. That's the funny thing, man. Like it, yes, it was more whiff than we thought. And, and you know, it was relatively speaking at lower levels. You know, we thought he was going to kind of fly up, but regardless, he's playing professional baseball and putting up well above average numbers. Of course I'd take that slash line. Uh, it is interesting to just see how much he's how quickly he's kind of fallen through the prospect ranks, given that he still has remained productive uh, when, when you look at what he's done. And of course, there's been more red flags and something to monitor, but it's not like he's, you know, I like comparing him and Austin Martin because those were the two high end hit tool guys that, you know, have not met expectations to me, him and Austin Martin aren't even near the same conversation. Um, no, and I think one of them still has, you know, above average upside at the big league level and the other one is is hoping to be a utility guy at best i think in a month or two nick could be the the solution at second base g1 bay has played second base in two of the first three games for the pirates he played center against a left-handed starter i think if you have reynolds in a corner reynolds played center in the series finale you know sawinski is like getting run in center field if you just put bay in center full-time and put gonzalez at second full-time I, I think you're very happy until tamar gets there Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I'm excited to see more from Nikki G because right now the swing looks good. Um, Andy, how has Andy looked as, and we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up on a couple quick indie points and then we'll kind of move on to uh, Taj and Grayson and what some of the takeaways were from that start and why they weren't as sharp as maybe some may have hoped. Yeah. I mean, Andy obviously lit the world on fire with his first swing of the season. It was a, a three run Homer, two run Homer, um, two right switch hitter against the right handed arm. Um, there were like 15 to 20 mile an hour winds blowing in from right field. And he just cut through it like that ball. It was probably like 360 that it went. I think that was a true 400 feet. If that wind is not blowing the way it is. I mean, it was absolutely pissed on um, after that. And he went quiet a little bit. He was two for 10. He had a single. He didn't, well, I think he came once in 10 plate appearances. Um, so you shouldn't be worried about like the 200 batting average. He's put together quality ABs. Um, I haven't been able to take much away from his defensive prowess because he caught Ortiz on opening night. And after that, he he caught Burroughs on Sunday. And that was a pretty good dynamic for five. But bullpen just imploded and he was you know, balls were sneaking past him left and right, but they were all the pitchers doing. So I, I can't speak to the defensive prowess much. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. And I'm excited to, to hear more about the defense because that's something that he, he earned time marks on. And I don't think we'll see him playing much defense in the infield. Burroughs looked sharp. I, I thought he was pretty impressive. And and obviously Ortiz kind of battled some command stuff, but still turned in, I think, a pretty pretty solid outing and, and showed you kind of what you have to look forward here. It, it makes sense that he started in AAA, though, because it's a guy that, you know, in, in Ortiz that could probably use, you know, another 10, 15 starts, maybe maybe a little less, depending on how he looks, just to continue to refine his command and, and continue to just kind of uh, be more polished as a pitcher instead of a thrower, uh, which I think he's getting there. Uh, you want to, like, kind of fly through all of the high-profile pitching prospects who did not do that well? Because there's a lot. There were a lot. Even Brandon Fott, who was, like, you know, a machine last year, didn't do well. How about yeah. somebody who actually didn't have one bad start at all last year? Gavin Stone 
didn't look great. Um, not worried about it, but we're just going to kind of highlight them, talk about what went wrong and talk about maybe what you should monitor moving forward. What was most interesting to me was it just seemed like command. And we we're going to talk about it on the just baseball show as well. It seemed like command across professional baseball just was a little bit shaky. Um, and, and I don't know what the byproduct of that would be. Like, you know, there was nothing different if, if this was, you know, COVID season when we were talking about like, you know, wonky spring training or, or off of a lockout or whatever it would be like, we could, we could uh, you know attribute it to that. It, it just seems like there was, there was command issues across professional baseball through the first start for many of these guys. Yeah. I think you have to look at the pitch clock. Um, I, I think That's that I fair. saw it right. I well, saw at the it major snowball. league side, but what about triple? I mean, they, they, these guys have been pitching with that. Pitch clock, man. I I don't think you really ever figure out a quick enough way to shake command woe. So like the the point that I brought up yesterday was, you know, so many guys are used to coming up. If you throw two straight balls, getting the ball back from the catcher, taking a circle around the mound, maybe taking your hat off, rubbing the ball up, shrugging your shoulders in through the nose, out through the mouth. You have no time for that anymore. So like a 2-0 start and you can't find it all of a sudden becomes a four pitch walk. So I think that things snowball quickly with the pitch clock. And I think that that is the main con for pitchers. And I heard that a little bit last year. I'm excited to talk to more people about it this year. Cause I do think that command can quickly get away. Um, number that I put out on Twitter, that'll be mentioned on the just baseball show. Um, we are up from, 11 to 15 starting pitchers on the opening weekend this year in major league baseball that walked four plus guys, wow. 30 starting pitchers walked three plus that's up from 23 a year ago. So I do think that the pitch clock is the number one cause of that. It's interesting though. Cause they, you know, a lot of these guys in the minors were, were working with that last year. So maybe it just takes a little bit of time to get back into the rhythm of things. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of fly through the stuff though, because I thought yeah. a lot of these guys, the, the, the stuff looked good overall, uh, but it just, it just, the command wasn't totally there. And I think that was exactly the case with the Grayson Rodriguez as well, as well as Todd Bradley. Right. So I will, um, I'll give you the line score for guys. And then if you want to walk through the stuff, so we'll go Brandon Fott and then Gavin Stone, and then we'll get into Taj and Grayson. You cool with that? Sure. Sounds good to me. Okay. So Fott in his first start on Sunday, didn't get out of the fourth. He threw three and two thirds. It took him 83 pitches to work three and two thirds Six hits, five runs, all earned. He allowed four home runs in three and two thirds, struck out seven, didn't walk anybody. So he was one of the few that wasn't bitten by the command bug. But four homers, you can't attribute to the PCL. I think that guy, he he might have just needed a start or two more out of spring training. Yeah, you know, it's tough because it's like he doesn't walk anyone, he punches out seven. Like in a nutshell, that, that looks really solid, right? But uh, it's just one of those things where, can you attribute a, a 114 mile per hour home run off the bat of uh Tyler Soderstrom to, to the PCL? Probably not. That's no. gone anywhere on earth, which by the way, Tyler Soderstrom, depending on how many games he plays in minor league baseball this year, whether he gets called up or not, that is my pick for minor league hitter of the year. I just want to put that out there. Um, not because of this game. I think I may have said it on the podcast in the past, but um, that's a guy that I, I really think is going to be a force uh, this year in the minor leagues. Did he catch or did he play first? Played first. I actually, I think he caught, I think he caught, uh, looking at it right now, he caught, um, I don't have a lot of faith in him as a catcher, but he did catch, uh, but getting back to Brandon fought, I mean, I'm looking at the location of these pitches, like, cause I, I'm clicking each, each one, the home run was a change up down the middle belt high. Mm. That's, that's going to get launched. Right. Um, you, you go to the JJ Blade home run. It was a fastball 93 down the middle belt high. Uh, you go to basically every single extra base hit was just a pitch left elevated. Kevin Smith home run, middle of the plate, above the belt. Like these were all middle, middle roughly, give or take a few inches upwards or downwards, but all right down the middle. That's okay. You know, like I, I'm I'm fine with that. Like Brendan Fott's probably my least alarming outing so far. Because yeah. he's attacking in the zone. He probably didn't feel like his command was great. I'd rather him throw strikes, not walk anybody. He still punched out seven. Uh, the velo was was mostly there at 94 miles an hour. And look, I, I respect him, you know, not starting to nibble and not, you know, losing confidence in his stuff. Like we had Mason Miller on of the A's who's, who's going to, you know, 
be somebody that I think is going to put up some really good numbers this year in the, in the A's organization. And he said a lot of the more veteran guys in the PCL said, you got to just take those starts. Sometimes you got to just uh, accept it because otherwise you're going to form bad habits. You're not going to trust your stuff. You're going to nibble. If there's days where you're leaving it over the middle, you're better off leaving it over the middle than trying to nibble the corners and creating bad habits and losing confidence in your stuff. So I'm not too worried about it. This is also a pretty good lineup you know, that, that you're going to have to deal with in Las Vegas, given that Kevin Smith is just a proven consistent minor league bat. Does Vegas Ibaday. beat the A's? Sorry. Does Vegas beat the A's? Be honest. <laughs> uh, Seven game series. Do you think the Las Vegas aviators get swept by their parent club? I think, I think, I think the aviators could get one. Damn. Cause I mean, you got Tyler Wade, you got Kevin Smith, you got Jonah bride. It's almost like, a, it's almost like adjacent to the team. Like it, it's pretty much their bench. Like it's, it's not, it's not much different. And then Soderstrom, I think you could put up there and he'd probably put up better offensive numbers than some of these guys. Well, has more than a hundred big league plate appearances under his belt. As does Cal Stevenson. Like this was a very, very experienced minor league triple a ball club. So I'm not too worried about it. Uh, just a lot of missing middle there on, on Brandon Fott. Got you. Uh, Gavin Stone, the next one for me. Uh, Stone, in his debut with Oklahoma City, he faced uh, the AAA affiliate of the Mariners, Tacoma. Two and two-thirds, didn't make it out of the third inning. He threw 63 pitches, 36 for strikes, which is not like him at all. Five hits, six runs, all earned. He allowed a homer, struck out three, but walked three, which, again, is not like him at all. This is so weird, and I think I saw the stat that you put out (laughs) <laughs> Stone allowed six earned in his first start. He allowed six earned in his final two months of the season. Yes. Dude. So this is a, that that stat in itself. Not I tweeted that not really to disparage Gavin Stone, more to talk about, you know, how dominant he was last year and how rare of a bad outing this was for him. This is the thing. Anyone else? I'm probably not even, you know, talking about it nearly as much. We'd be talking about it on the podcast, but like that stat is very telling. It's also worth noting, like we shouldn't pit him against himself, right? Like yeah. I don't think anybody else in, in triple A had that kind of stretch where they gave up six runs over two months. I don't think anybody else did that. So it, it was pretty wild to see the command issues though, right? Like, like three walks from Gavin Stone, five hits and two and two thirds. This isn't, this lineup isn't as much of a force, but it is a lot of big leaguers. So, I mean, that's worth noting. Like he had to deal with Evan White, Mike Ford, Colin Moran, Delino DeShields, and then, you know, Zach Deloche and and some other decent prospects. But like, I was pretty shocked by this outing. Three walks from Stone. I don't have like the game logs in front of me, but I I don't think he walked even three very often. No, I and I can tell you what he did last year, um, but I mean, Stone is like kind of the, I wouldn't say the antithesis, but like everything you worry about with Bobby Miller, you don't really worry about with Stone. And everything you worry about with Stone, you don't worry about with Bobby Miller. And one of the things that you worry about with Bobby is are at-bats going to get away from him or innings going to get away from him? Because while he does have overpowering stuff, maybe he misses upstairs on five straight fastballs and things start to snowball. That was never Stone. Stone was a big, you know, hard reset and then get back to the command ways. And and he was the type that could put together a month where he strikes out 30 and walks two. And that was not what he looked like at all. So what's interesting, it was the fastball command, right? So listen to this breakdown, dude. He threw 26 four seam fastballs and also four more sinkers. Um, The 26 four seamers, 14 balls, 12 strikes. That's that's bizarre. The change up, 24 changeups, 16 strikes, eight balls. He was literally commanding the changeup better than his fastball. But if you're if you're going to land the fastball to stri- at a 46% strike rate, you're in trouble. You're just not going to succeed. Then he only threw four sliders because he, I don't think he had any confidence to, in throwing strikes. I'm, I'm surprised we didn't see him go to the slider more given how bad the fastball command was. And looking at the charts, man, like he was tugging glove side and then missing up and in on righties. Like it just wasn't there. I'll chalk it up to shaking off the rust start one. But for those who are like Dodgers fans that like to watch games, if I'm going to give you something to watch for the next start fastball command, if he spots a changeup, don't be like, Oh, he looks good. If he's commanding the changeup, we'll be fine. No, that's a, that's a field pitch that he always has the feel for 
Let's see him command the fastball. That's the thing to watch, I think, in the next start. What's really wild, though, is he was dominant in spring training. So I'm going to take this one with a grain of salt, say just the fastball command wasn't there for him, see how he bounces back next start. But it is weird to see Gavin Stone not have fastball command, given the fact that he landed it for a strike, the heater, last year at a 67% clip. So, you know, that that's very uncharacteristic for him. Yeah, so last thing on Gavin Stone, he walked – more than two guys five times last year in those five starts he allowed a combined three earned runs so when he did not have command he had no hit stuff like he just scattered the walks yeah so this was like probably the worst outing of his professional career let me go back to 2021 real quick because i I bet i mean so he allowed six in four but he struck out eight and walk anybody on August 19th, 2021. So yeah, I, I think that this is the worst outing of Gavin Stone's professional career. Well, that's, that's just trouble in paradise there. I'm not worried about stone, but you know, let's just monitor that fastball command. That's a pretty interesting note. We'll get to the, uh, the, the two Goliaths, right? Yeah. Let's go to G rod here. Um, Grayson Rodriguez, 75 pitches in four innings, 48 for strikes, uh, G rod four innings, four hits, three runs, just two were earned. He allowed one Homer. Uh, he struck out two. He faced 21 hitters and he struck out two. He walked four. You expect that number to be higher for G rod in terms of the K department. It was not, I don't know. Like what did you take away from this? Cause I, I don't know. I, I guess I kind of heard Mike Elias in the back of my head yeah. saying, I told you so. I told you so. <laughs> He stinks. Like, yeah. yeah, look, look, he 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 had some points in time where I'm like, oh, there's G-Rod. But then there were others where I'm like, this doesn't look like him. Right. And, um, yeah, he, he kind of mixed up everything. He, he threw 36 fastballs, 16 changeups, 12 curveballs, seven cutters, four sliders. What's interesting is it's just the fastball wasn't playing that well for him like he he just wasn't getting that many chases at the top of the zone it wasn't didn't seem like it had the same amount of life obviously that's something I'm, I struggle to comment on unless I'm in person you know we could talk about the shape the shape was all right the velocity was there he averaged 97 miles an hour on the fastball but it, it just he didn't look like the same Grayson in terms of the stuff jumping out of his hand, you know, because the fastball kind of sets the tone for the rest of his ridiculous arsenal, which is, you know, just tunneling off of it, everything moving in different directions. He just seemed like he was kind of experimenting, uh, you know, off of the fastball too. like the change up wasn't totally there for him. Uh, he still got a couple good swings, swing and misses on it. The curveball looked all right in spurts, but again, he just didn't seem to have a ton of confidence and was just trying to find the one out pitch and just didn't seem like he had that going for him. Um, you know, he still turned in a fine, like if you're going to have a, if that's your bad outing, right. Four innings, th- two runs earned, like that's fine. But I mean, this is a guy that's supposed to be in triple a right now, dominating and working his way back to the, you know, to, to the big leagues in his defense and and not to kind of get repetitive here. This is probably one of the most talented minor league teams in baseball over there in Durham, right? You got Vidal Brujan, Curtis Mead. This is the lineup in order. Vidal Brujan, Curtis Mead, Jonathan Aranda, Rene Pinto, Tristan Gray, Oslavis Basabe, Kyle Manzardo in the fucking seven hole. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Ben Gamble was the eight hitter. who's was an experienced big leaguer. And then Cameron Meisner in the nine hole. So it, it was a tough lineup to kind of roll right into, but, but Grayson Rodriguez should be handling these kind of guys uh, should be handling any lineup. We're expecting him to handle big league lineups. Uh, it was surprising to see him struggle this way. Uh, Rene Pinto took him deep uh, on a fastball. That was kind of where it seemed like things after the first inning started to slow down a little bit. You know, I thought Jonathan Aranda kind of disrupted him a little bit because he goes ball strike called swinging strike balls, a fastball by him. And then just couldn't put him away. Couldn't locate that. Didn't get him to, to bite on the elevated heater. Then Aranda spoils a change up. He actually threw a fastball 100 miles an hour, misses with it just off the edge, and then misses with another fastball. Aranda takes the walk, and then it just seemed like that kind of threw him off a little bit Um, because that was with two outs, and then the next batter, Pinto, hits a home run. That's what Aranda does. Yeah, can I tell you that feels very Tampa? Like, that's what the Rays are going to do. If it's not Wander Franco, if it's not, you know, and like, Franco, a Rosarena, and even like a Jose Siri have different approaches than like the typical Ray. But uh, that feels very like, hey, the six hitter in the Tampa lineup is going to mind fuck you a little yeah. bit. And, yeah. and that's exactly what Aranda did. 
a hundred percent. And, you know, I think Basabe, Oslevis Basabe had some really good at bats against him, including a hundred six. That kid's good. He's good, man. We talked about him on the Rays episode. Like he's good. He, he's starting to hit the ball a little bit harder. Like I have a 70 on his hit tool. If he's showing even 45 power, which I think he's starting to show, this guy's going to be a big leaguer. Like he, he just sprays the ball all over. He hits it just hard enough. There was a ball he hit over the head of Hudson Haskin that you see Haskin running back and you, he thinks he can catch it in stride because he's thinking of who, who it came off the bat of. And you see Haskin almost look like a deer in headlights. Like, oh my gosh, this thing's going to keep going. And it kept going to beat him over the head. It was 105.4 off the bat. He's will surprise you with how hard he can hit the baseball. But Sabe kind of wore him down. Uh, but he also had some some balls kicked around behind him. I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. You know, most of the walks, I think he only had one four pitch walk and it was to Manzardo. Um, and it was just because he wasn't locating the change up there that he usually spots up against lefties. Right. I'm not too worried about Grayson. He touched 100. He looks healthy. I think this lineup wore him out a little bit. Um, uh, you know, there was, again, an error behind him, too, that kind of snowballed things as well in another inning. Let's see how he does in the next outing. He did finish strong, too, punched out Aranda on three pitches. He went fastball, change up fastball. And I was like, that's the G-Rod I know. Uh, I thought he finished strong. You know, so I, I think he's going to be OK. I think he had to work through it a little bit. But I, I'm interested to watch the next start because if it's this again, then we have another conversation to have. But the stuff is there. And that's the most important thing off a guy coming off of, of that injury last year. For sure. Um, same conversation with Taj Bradley, right? If he struggles like this again, you might start to get a little concerned. And, and you mentioned that Taj had the mid nineties fastball tapered off a little bit. That was the matchup of the year that we got on opening day. That was the minor league game that was featured on MLB TV. <laughs> and Taj Bradley goes two plus 55 pitches, 32 strikes, which is not a good percentage. Not characteristic all. either. I, yeah, he is a strike thrower. And like you talk about his electric stuff, his fastball is crazy, his slider is elite. But I mean, he is a zone pounder and he was not a zone pounder in this one. Two innings, four hits, three runs, all earned, a home run allowed, struck out four, but walked three. Tosh just wasn't right. No, it, and, and it was weird because you watch him in the last batter. And I think this is why they pulled him. And and I, I hope he's good. We haven't earn anything but i think it's interesting that he's pulled at 55 pitches and his velocity in that last batter the last fastball he threw of the game was 92 miles an hour mm. this is this is an athletic guy who's in great shape who averages mid 90s with the fastball the first the, the first fastball of the game he threw was 97 the second fastball of the game he threw was 98 the third was 97 and the fourth was 97 like that is what we're used to seeing from Taj. so to see 98 down to 92 and a matter of 40 pitches is weird and he might be fine he might just have a little bit of dead arm he might have just not been feeling right but whatever it was i think that the rays saw that you know or the durham bulls i should say saw that and said let's just get him out of here let's not have him throw there's a lot of research i wish i could attribute it properly but i've heard this from several different people in the pro ranks that that would stand by five fatigued pitches is more damaging to your arm than a hundred regular pitches because you're changing your arm action and, and you're going to do things that your body's not used to. So good on the, on, on Durham to pull him here. I wouldn't raise any red flags. I think he just wasn't quite ready. And, and I think we saw that this year. He needs to build up a bit more. Man, I mean, you're compensating, right? When you get yeah. fatigued, you start compensating and you work muscle groups that you typically don't work. And that's where you run into issues. If you don't have a well-trained muscle, and you put that at 100% max effort all of a sudden, that thing is going to go into like shock. Yeah. And that's usually when something snaps or pulls or yeah. anything like something that. Something else compensates and, and you're in trouble. And and that's yeah. that that's so I'm glad they took him out. For him, velocity is going to be the thing we got to watch next start now. How does he sustain it deeper into starts? Yes, 100%. And like last real world comp, if uh, somebody has like knee or hip issues, chances are the other knee is going to get screwed yep. up at some point, right? Because you, you're so used to not like favoring that other knee. You're the so human body is very, very smart. <laughs> it's very smart. So like, yeah, I, I can totally understand that. So better safe than sorry there. I think pulling him after 55 pitches and they were also like 55 high effort pitches. He yeah. was averaging, you know, 25 to 30 pitches per inning. Yeah. That's not good. 
get him, get him out of there. And that's what they did. Wow. And, and, and he'll be fresh for the next start. Hopefully what I will say though, is there were flashes, right? And when you see him like scouting reports, this guy flashes, this flashes that he did flash the change up. He got Cowser on a really well located change up, you know, to start the ball game off. I saw that and I'm like, Oh, we're in for a show. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. That's why for those betters out there, Live betting's a trap, baby, because I would have live bet the under on this bad boy after I saw mm-hmm. that. He gets Norby swinging on a slider as well. He goes fastball up, slider down and away, slider Norby spits on it, and then triples on the slider and gets him swinging. I'm like, holy crap, he's going to shove. Then Westberg, 106, right back up the box. O'Hearn, 3-1, doubles into the gap. And then Lester walks, and then the wheels, you know, you think the wheels would fall off. They don't. He strikes out Haskin, but I feel like that inning kind of wore him down. And then he goes into the second and just looks taxed. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of what happened to him there. Let's talk about the bats between these two lineups though, real quick. And then we'll hit on a couple other quick points. We'll hit on Libertor and then, you know, probably wrap up unless there's anything else, you know, you come across here, but I want to talk about Norby because Norby Connor Norby of, of the Orioles organization is off to a great start. He's going to be a back end top 100 guy for us. And by the way, that should be coming out this week. Uh, we're, we're well along, you know, in these write-ups and, and, and getting that ready to go. Norby did yeah. Homer. He struck out twice, but I love the way he adjusted did Homer in that, in that uh, game did Homer again later swing looks great. It, to me, he's as, as safe of a bat as you're going to find. Kowser has continued to look good since spring training. Uh, he, he's hit some balls really, really hard. We talked about Basabe on the Rays side, um, but sticking on the Orioles side before we jump over to the Rays side, this is one of the tougher lineups. And I think Norby and Westberg are going to make it really tough for you know the Orioles to justify you know either playing Adam Frazier every day who did have a really good opening series <laughs> yeah. and not trading Ramon Arias you know I do wonder you know I was talking about it with with one of our writers Clay Snowden um, at just baseball about you know who could be a, a taker for Ramon Arias you know obviously it's it's expecting a lot for either of Norby or Jordan Westberg to just come up and give you a 110 WRC plus which is kind of what you get from Arias but especially Westberg can play all over the diamond like Arias. Uh, but Norby, I think that bat is even safer than Westberg's. I think one of those two guys could give you above average big league at bats in a couple months. Uh, and, and I think the Orioles are going to have a, a tough decision to make because it's going to get kind of silly. I think at some point having these guys down there, because I think Westberg and Norby are that good. Can we just commit to having Gunner at third, Norby at second, and Mateo until Westbrook is ready at short. That's like, I think that solves every problem and, and trade Arias for pitching. I, and well, here's the thing too. You could even flip-flop Gunner to short and Westbrook to third. Sure. Like, but yeah, I agree. Like I, I think I, Mateo's I, like Mateo's the shortstop right now. We know. No, no, right now. I'm saying like matters. eventually, yeah. I think I like Gunner a little bit more at short. Okay. Westbrook's got a good arm at third, but like, regardless, like your point stands, like, they should be moving in that direction. And I know they want to be competitive. Well, you didn't get any pitchers. You know, your 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 rotation upgrade was Cole Irvin. Like, so if you're telling and Kyle if you're, Gibson, if yeah. you're telling me that that you're in win now mode, I don't buy it. How about let's be let's be in win now mode while playing your youngsters, who I think could actually give you a better foot forward. Uh, so I, I'm interested to see how they do that. Obviously, I'm fine with with Westberg and Norby having another month or two of at bats there. I think that's justifiable. Uh, sure. But these guys have both mashed, showed the power, and bring a lot of things to the table. So um, Norby, it's as simple of a swing you're going to find. I, I think that's one of the safer bats. I loved him out of the draft. And Westberg, kind of the same story, a little bit more swing and miss, but more athletic. So it's kind of, a you know, if you're going to give a little bit, at least you're taking some back too, which is athleticism with Westberg and the ability to play short, third, second. Hell, you could probably throw him in the outfield. Yep. Real quick on the Rays side, Kyle Manzardo. Um, we talked about the power. He hit. He matched his max exit velocity from last year. That's something to monitor because Manzardo, that's the one question, right? His 90th percentile last year was like 102.5. You want to see more than that from a first baseman just because I I got a good question in the replies, which was like, well, if he's hitting for power, why does it matter? Well, because you're not going to get as many middle, middle mistakes that allow you to unleash all of your power on it. And there's going to be balls that you don't get all of that You want to be able to hit out and a lot of home runs at the major league level. Guys don't get all of them. Also balls that you miss hit carry in the gap. It just gives you a larger margin for error instead of having to barrel everything for extra bases. Yeah. We will never see a Ryan Howard again. And Ryan Howard only hit mistakes and he won an MVP by only hitting middle, middle, fast. 
fastballs deep. We're never going to get that again because pitching is a lot better than it was even 10 years ago. So, you know, you will see mishit balls that leave. And I think O'Neill Cruz is a great example of that. I mean, you saw the viral clip of Shohei Otani in that exhibition hitting a home run off of a knee in the World Baseball Classic. Like these superhuman athletes are going to hit balls that have no business getting out, out. So if you are not a superhuman athlete, Manzardo, while a very good baseball player, is not O'Neill Cruz or Shohei Otani. <laughs> um, Manzardo needs to be able to backspin some balls out. He can't get all of a middle, middle fastball and hit 30 homers. Or, he wants or, to be a 30 homer guy. He needs to be able to hit the ball hard consistently. A hundred percent. Or, you know, you're also just not going to be able to place the ball everywhere at all times. The harder you hit it, the higher expected batting average, no matter how, yeah. even if you're anti-stat cast, it's, it's very, very clear cut. The harder here's, you hit it, the higher the batting average. So here's that, the number. Here's the number that should shut everybody up. Batted balls at the major league level last year that left the bat at 95 miles an hour or harder 488 batting average 954 slug that's a 1400 ops that was batted balls at 93 plus 457 with an ops at 1332 yeah and and if you have higher max exit velocities and higher 90th percentile exit velocities odds are your miss hits are going to be higher than 93 94 95 gives you a larger margin for error speaking of which We'll talk about Brett Beatty and then Matthew Libertor. Yes. Brett freaking Beatty should be in the major leagues right now. Yeah. Brett Beatty is a card that I have purchased on eBay going into the season, plenty of, and now I'm almost kicking myself for not buying more, but I got, I, I like, I'm unhealthy that way. And I need to just be like, arm, it's okay. You bought a couple, you will yeah. make money on it and, and, or keep it and have a really prized card and leave it at that. Then I start panicking and wanting to buy more and then end up paying too much when the hype gets crazy. Cause he's going off and I guarantee his cards are going up <laughs> on eBay right now, but Beatty could not have had a better start because he's also showing it with the leather. Uh, He's had some nice plays. He looks to continue to get better there. I I think he's an average defender at third now at the big league level, which is huge from where he once was. He might even be slightly above average as he continues to get better. But so far through three games, 357, 400, 857. He's got a pair of home runs. And that game he had, was it it yesterday or or two days ago? I think it was Saturday. Saturday, he goes four for four with two home runs and a double uh, and five driven in. But not only that, he's hitting the crap out of the ball. Like he's hitting it hard. He flicked a double the other way. It looked like a like almost a nonchalant B swing, 111 miles an hour. Like this guy is hitting the ball hard and all over and looks like a polished hitter. This, this is a guy that should be in playing third base for the New York Mets. Here's my analysis on Brett Beatty. Eduardo Escobar is one for 16 with seven strikeouts. Yeah. That's come on. How, how long do you think till we see him? Two weeks, two weeks. His grand slam went one twelve off the bat. The other way, right? I believe so. Dude. I mean, you're hitting a ball 112 miles an hour to left as a lefty bat. He also, what are we doing one... in Worcester? He also popped a one thirteen. Yeah, I mean, like, this is done. Everybody knows it. Every Mets fan knows it. Get Brett Beatty up, man. You want to win now? Brett Beatty puts you in the best scenario to win right effing now. Yeah, and and I believe it was off of a lefty. Um, Beatty's ready. He's 23. Um, it, you got to get him up by June 3rd to have him eligible for, like, you know, draft compensation because it's different. They have a little bit more time now, which, which sucks. That's why I think they're going to bring him up sooner. There's no gain of delaying him. Even if they didn't think he could win rookie of the year and get the draft compensation because his clock started last year. So to manipulate his service time, they'd have to keep him down till June 3rd. So to me, that makes no sense. He might as well call him up now. I don't know what else he really needs to show you on that same point. Matt Mervis off to a good start. I think he's already, he's already homered. He's already doubled. Both of those were off of lefties. The homer came on a 93 mile an hour fastball elevated from a lefty. Wow. I was told he can't do that. Um, So he looks really good as well. Yes. A hundred percent, man. Libby to wrap. Mm -mm, Libby to wrap. Um, We have kind of ridden roller coaster here with Libertor. And I want to say that I am kind of back in, is that acceptable? Yeah, it is, because I'm all the way back in, too. Libby, five innings, 82 pitches, 55 for strikes, four hits, no runs, seven punch-outs, two walks. The seven punch-outs, six came on the curveball, 
And the last one came on a 98 mile an hour sinker. Yeah. So who is this? This is a different guy. <laughs> this is a different guy. So I was hearing some things from some, some, my buddy, Jeff Ponds at baseball America had been mentioning to me too. He's like, dude, like don't sleep on Libby. Don't sleep on Libby. And, and a lot of people in the industry started talking about like, there's good things coming out, you know, from Cardinals camp, which is right down the road over here. Yeah. I didn't get the chance to see Libby, but I was hearing that. And then you see what he did in the first start. It's not just that he pitched better. It's not just that he commanded the crap out of his stuff, which by the way, he's landing his fastball for a strike more than he ever has so far. That's dating back to spring training as well. Fastballs ticked up like almost two ticks sat 95 in that outing. I don't think he's ever touched 98. I've never seen him touch 98, which allows the curveball to play up too, because the curveball used to be more like 73, 74 slow bender. Now it's 77 with that shape. Sometimes he'll manipulate it to 73 to like land it for a strike, which is fine, you know, as a first pitch, but a curveball from 73 to 77 is a big difference when it has that kind of shape. It's more of that power 12, six. That's gross. So you got a bunch of swings and misses off of that. But also when the fastball is 95, his four seamer is playing up way more. And he's got the sinker that he's using more now, which he wasn't using before his four seamer at 93, 92 was getting pummeled because the shape's not great at 95. It's doing better because it's tunneling off of that, of that 12, six, and it's a couple ticks higher. And the sinker is a couple ticks higher. This is going to play, man. I'm, I'm excited to follow this because his command is better. His fastball is multiple ticks up. He's using a sinker and it's even allowing him to, to mix in, you know, a slider and a change up. And now this change up, which was fringy looks better because it's working off of a good fastball. Uh, and, and that slider has improved too. This guy has a legit four pitch mix. His velocity's up and his command's better. So at 23 years old, Libby might have found it, man. At 6'5", too, you can't really teach that kind of size and pitchability from a lefty. Now the stuff's there. No, and here's what StatCast gave me on Libby. I've got um, – he threw 36 four-seamers, 24 curveballs, 10 change-ups, 7 sliders, 5 sinkers. So the four-seamer sat 95. The sinker sat 96. The curveball, 76. The slider, 86. The change-up, 87. Cool. cool. Like, and, and for reference there um, on what Libby like kind of sat last year, his fastball last season was, and it got better as the year went on. I think that's kind of how he rode that momentum into this year, but his fastball last year sat 93 through his first 20 starts. Okay, so two ticks up. Curveball sat nine, 73. Two Slider ticks up. sat 85. He's two ticks up. Two ticks up with better command is night and day also landed the curveball for a strike last year, less than 60% of the time. That hasn't been the case of these starts. So watch Libby. I think he might give the, the Cardinals some, some solid innings this year. And it's good to see him, you know, kind of figuring it out and, and putting it all together here at 23 years old. He's still young. Libby threw 13 or uh, through what? 24 curveballs. He got 13 swings, 10 swings and misses. Yeah. That's, Again, when it's sharper like that, the problem is it was so, we used to talk about it, it was so loopy. It was like 71 miles an hour. And if you know it's coming, it gets hit into oblivion. Like that yeah. was the Mackenzie Gore problem too. Yeah. The Gore curveball was pretty, but it was getting shit on. And he was a fastball slider changeup guy at his best. Yeah. And now the slider is being used more. And that's just another pitch you got to think about. Last thing on Libby, 17 of the 20 batters he faced in that start were righties. So hmm. he's getting righties out. Yeah, that's a he couldn't have had a better first start to the season. Uh, love seeing that from Libertor. That's all I got, man. We're gonna do top lineups or, or top minor league rosters uh, as yeah. we get the assignments finalized. Uh, they're pretty much finalized, but they're not all totally public yet. So we'll probably do those rosters in the next day or two. Um, anything else to look out for? Uh, obviously, encourage any of those who you know enjoy listening to. Jack to go tune into those Indianapolis Indian games on MILB TV. I guess it's all under MLB TV now though. Um, yeah. Obviously Jack does a great job over there with Howard Kelman, uh, but I'm, I'm looking forward to just being able to tune into all of these minor league games. We got double a opening day, the seventh, when is high a opening days at the same day? I think the same day. And so, then low a is a little bit after that. Um, real quick. Here's the way to get minor league ball on MLB TV. If you're like, why can't I watch these minor league games on TV? Um, Because I do think you still have to go to MILB.TV. Nice shot for the YouTube people for Aram. Um, But 
if you go to MILB TV, you can watch it the same way. But if you go to MLB TV on your television, on your smart TV, and you want to watch a minor league game there, what you have to do is set that parent club as your favorite team. So for me, I've got my favorite team set as the Pirates. So on my Roku, on my smart TV, I can watch Indians, Curve, Greensboro, and Bradenton games on my smart TV. So if you really want to watch G-Rod and Taj Bradley and you want you know, that game in Durham set the Rays is your favorite team. And then you can watch that one on your TV. Perfect. That was actually helpful for me too. I didn't yeah. totally know that yet. So that that's there very helpful. Go. All right. Appreciate that. That's it for the call up today. We will have the best lineups for you and the best rosters across minor league baseball in the coming days with the top 100 on the heels of that as well. We are almost there. So always thank you for listening. Look forward to talking prospects with you later this week.